2 Kings chapter 22. Amen. If you're there, say amen. amen. We'll read from verse 8 through 11. The word of God is read in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it says in Hilkiah, the high priest said unto Shaphan, Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan, the scribe, came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan, the scribe, showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. But listen to verse 11. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. I want you to stay on 2 Kings chapter 22. Because I want to talk to you a little bit about an event that happened in the Bible that sometimes it's uncommon for us to uh, hear about it, but it's very important to hear about it. I want to discuss uh, a man by the name of Josiah. He was the king of the southern kingdom of Israel. He was named King Josiah. And as we just read, there was an event that took place during his reign at a very young age. If you go with me to 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 1, the Bible says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. Listen to that. He was eight years old. And it begins to say, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jediah and the daughter of Adonai of, of Boskath, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But listen to what verse 2 says in the second half. And walked in all the way of David his father. So we have here a young child, an 80-year-old child, who has been chosen to be the king of the southern kingdom of Israel. The most important kingdom out of the two, of the north and the south, because the south, as you and I know, history tells us, Jesus would come from the southern kingdom. So they played a very important role in all of Bible history and prophecy. But as we begin to read the Word of God, we're, in, we're confronted with a young child who is placed in position to be the leader of God's people. And he's eight years old. But one of the things that we notice right away, and the historian begins to write in verse 2, he says that he walked right in the sight of the Lord. <clears throat> Why did he walk right? It says because he walked all the way in the way of, his, of, uh, of, the way of David, his father. But not only that, but he turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. 2 Thessalonians 2.15, the Apostle Paul told, told us once, he said, Stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or epistle. I want to focus on that real quick, and then we'll jump back to what Josiah, what's going on here with Josiah. If you go with me to 2 Thessalonians 2.15. While you're getting there, I'll read it one more time. In 2 Thessalonians 2.15, Paul says, Stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, we know that this verse emphasizes the importance of persevering and upholding the teachings and doctrines that have been passed down to us through the Word of God, that were given to the apostles by Jesus Christ. So, in other words, what the Apostle Paul is telling us, that we are to hold firm to the Word of God in our day today. When he says the Apostles' Doctrine, he's talking about that which was given to them by Jesus. 
And then when we talk about Jesus' teachings, we're talking about that which was given to Jesus by His Father. Because then in one occasion, Jesus said, my will is to do the will of Him that sent me. Or my food is to do the will of Him that sent me. Who, who sent Him? His Father. And Paul is telling us here that we are to stand firm, hold the traditions. He's not talking about man-made traditions. He's not talking about church traditions. But he's talking about the established traditions of the Word of God that you and I have today. So what Paul is trying to tell us today is that we are to hold on to the Word of God and not to stray away from it. And there's going to be great results when you and I begin to truly hold on to the Word of God. Now, what does it mean to hold on to the Word of God? It means to live what you preach. <clears throat> How important is that for us? To live what we preach. To live what you say. If you say something, live it. And Paul is telling us this clearly. Now, let's go back to the book of 2 Kings 22. And you're going to have to excuse me. I have a little cough today. 2 Kings 22. Returning back to what Josiah and what's taking place here, this young boy becomes ruler of Israel, of, this, of the southern kingdom at eight years old. But you know, despite his youth, he was surrounded by godly people who helped him find the right path and seek after God the God of his ancestor, David. David was like his great, 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 great grandpa. And the first thing that Josiah does, the moment he is placed in a position of leadership, he seeks after God. What does that tell you? That tells you that those that were around this young child told him, you cannot rule correctly as a leader of God's people without God's direction. How do we apply what we're seeing here to our day, uh, to our lives today? You and I, we, we cannot live our lives without the direction of God. I cannot la lead my own life. I can't lead my marriage. Or I can't lead my family or my children without the direction of God. And the first thing Josiah does is that he seeks after God. And as he begins to seek after God, verse 2 says that he turned not to the right. He didn't turn to the left. But what happened? It said, in other words, he stayed in the path that was right, in the balanced path. He didn't turn to the right or to the left. He didn't look for his own understanding. He looked for God. Now, as we begin to read this story, and you, when you go back home, I would love for you to read it in, in 2 uh, Kings 22 we begin to see that Josiah begins to grow up in the Lord. He begins to grow up. But guess what happened? He had been appointed king of a nation that had totally given their backs to God. Don't that sound like some nations that we know of today? He's appointed at eight years old to take care of a nation that had strayed away so much from God that they had forgotten everything about the Word of God. And the first thing, as we begin to read the story of Josiah, the first thing he begins to do is that he begins a great reformation of all the country of the southern kingdom. And he goes and he, and he tells his leaders, he says, take down all the idols that are all over the land that were being used to sacrifice. You see, as we spoke a few Sundays ago, uh, Israel had separated so much from God, they had abandoned God to the point that they were even sacrificing their own babies. They had become like the idol nations around them. You remember before they had a king when Samuel was directing them and God was directing the nation, but the moment came when they told Samuel, you know what, we don't want a king. I mean, we don't want God to direct us. We want a king like everybody else. Now, this was the consequence of their actions, that the nation had strayed away so far from God. What happens when an individual or a nation or a church or a group of people turn their backs on God? We begin to think that we can do all things with our own might and our own power. And then we ask ourselves down the line, why are things 
going the way they're going in my life? Why are things so out of order in my life, personally, individually, in my marriage, in my family, in the local church? Why are things so out of whack? Because to a certain degree, we have told God we don't need Him. Now, I could speak of our nation because I'm a citizen of the United States. We can, I, I, can, I can talk to you about other nations, but what concerns me would be more my country. What, is that, what does that mean? That I can also speak of myself and my home because I live in my home. I can't speak for you in front of God. It's between you and God. You know, we were speaking with our children on the way here to church this morning that one day we're going to face God by ourselves. My wife is not going to be there. I'm not going to be there. My children will face God by themselves. It's you and God. And Josiah begins his search by looking for the ways of God through David. Listen to this. This is so wonderful that as he begins to see this, his eyes begin to open up and he begins to see the darkness that is around him that had engulfed his nation. And I imagine because the Bible says that around the age of 16, he began a great reformation and Josiah said, what have we done? What have we done to our nation? And, then, and that comes a moment in our lives as individuals that there's a moment where there's like an epiphany. We wake up and we say, God, what, look how far I've strayed away from you. Look how far I've gone. I knew the word of God. And Josiah begins a great reformation. He begins to clean up the the, the, the eye. He begins to destroy all the statues, everything. It's a huge reformation. And God is, is happy with Josiah because of what he's doing. And then all of a sudden, Josiah says, wait a minute. We have to go and rebuild the temple that's falling apart. You remember when Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees on one occasion, and they're, they're making fun of him, and they're saying, how, how are you going to destroy this, this uh, uh, temple in three days, and you're going to rebuild it again? And then, there, and then he said, well, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He rejoiced when he saw me. They said, so well, how do you, you, you don't know Abraham. And he says, before Abraham was, I was. But they didn't understand what he was saying. And he said, in three days, I'm going to rebuild this temple. They didn't know that he was talking about his body. So he's using at that moment the temple as an illustration of his body. And Josiah here, let's go back here, go to verse 8. And Helakai, Helakai, the high priest, let's, let's go here real quick, verse 8. And Helakai, Hilkiah, the high priest, said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Now we'll stop right there. What's going on at that moment in verse 8? After Josiah begins a reformation of the country, he sends his one of his prime ministers, he sends them to the temple and he says, Hey, I want you to gather the money that the Levites that were ministering in the house of God, I want you to gather the money give it to the builders, and I want you to begin to repair the walls. You see, they had strayed away so far from God that the center of worship was in shambles. The center of worship was falling apart. And I look at that and I say, wow, what, how can I compare that to my life as a person? When we stray away so much from God, what begins to happen in our own lives? Everything begins to what? Fall apart. And we're in shambles. And we ask ourselves, why is everything falling apart? When God is probably trying to tell you it's falling apart because I'm trying to get your attention. Many times when I've been through situations, or, or many people that I know have been through situations, it's because at that moment God is trying to get your attention. Probably he's been doing it all week, since Monday to Sunday. He's been probably knocking on the door, trying to get your attention with all everything going on this week. And you're saying, well, what's going on? It's God saying, hey, speak to me. Let me help you out. And Josiah tells him, go and repair the walls. And as he's repairing the walls, as they begin to patch the walls, something so sad happened at that moment. They begin, they found 
the word of God, the book of the law, had been lost in the house of God. Oh, man. Isn't that sad? They had strayed away so far from God that they lost his word in his house. They were God's people. They had been chosen by God. They had taken a covenant with God to be his people. They even told him on Mount Sinai, everything he says, we shall do it. We will do it. But what happened? They forgot about God. And the word of God was lost. It's as if I'd be searching for my Bible all week, not knowing where it's at. When in reality, it may be at home sitting in the same place I left it the week before and never touched it. They lost. God's word. And Josiah is shocked to hear this. You know, he didn't have that information. He just sent him to rebuild and patch up the walls. And then here comes Hilkiah, the high priest. I'm, we're talking about the high priest, the man that you would have to tie bells to his, to his robe all the way in the bottom, and they would tie him up, and he would enter the holies of holies. And if he wasn't living right, he'd fall dead. And they'd drag him out. You're talking about the high priest that had to be present once a year to ask God for the forgiveness of the sins of the people. And guess what happens? He finds the word of God lost in the house of God. What did he say? I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. But listen to how sad this is. Go to verse 9 with me. And Shaphan, the scribe, came to the king. So he goes to Josiah. He shows up. And I imagine he has the book of the laws with him. And brought king word again. Thy servants have gathered money that was found in the house and they have delivered it into the hand of them to do the work that have the oversight of the house. And Shaphan, in verse 10, the scribe showed the king, saying, he said, hey, look, Hilkiah the priest has delivered me a book. He didn't even call it the book of the law. He just said, hey, he gave me a book. Listen, to, have you, ever, you ever, when you read the word of God, really analyze what you're reading and think about it. He knew it was the law of God. But for some reason, he just tells the king, hey, you know what? We found a book. Here's a book. They told me to deliver this book to you. Not of much importance to him. Because if it was important, he would have ran and he would have said, Josiah, we found the book of the law. But what does it say here? And it came to pass that the king had heard the words of the book of the law. And what did he do? He rent his clothes. What does that mean? He tore it apart. You know, renting your clothes at that time was an expression of immediate danger that something bad was about to happen or that somebody had died. And Josiah rents his clothes. He rips it off and he says, oh, I can't believe this. Can you imagine? I can just imagine Josiah, after this reformation, after God is leading him, they find the word of God. And when he began to read, thou shall not have other gods than me. I imagine when he heard that part, he fell to the floor and he said, my God, we have strayed away so far from your word. Does it have to take that type of situation for God to get our attention today? No. I hope it doesn't. Does it have to take a catastrophe to take place, not just in our nation or in this world, for God to wake people up today? I hope not. But sometimes when we look outside and we look at our lives, it seems as if maybe that's what it's going to take for God to wake these people up today, to wake us up today. Don't wait until you have to go through a situation as tough and worse than Josiah and what the nation did for God to get your attention. You don't need somebody to come and tell you, oh, God told me to tell you this. And I know that God can work that way, but you don't need that. All you need to do is open up the word of God 
and get on your knees and pray and say, God, let your Holy Spirit help me to understand your word. And there's things on here that I don't understand, but God help me to understand them. And you know what the Bible says? That Josiah rent his clothes. Why? Because he knew that there was danger when we reject and neglect God's word. There's danger. It showed us how Israel as a nation or individuals had neglected the reading and the studying of the word of God. Don't study the word of God or read the Bible just on Sundays. Do it every day. Get into the Word every day. Really get into the Word. You know, our, our second pastoral in Florida years ago, when we, uh, when we landed in Wildwood, Florida, it was so Wildwood. It was so Backwood. You know, we come from South Central L.A. At 2 a.m. in the morning, you want to eat Chinese? Chinese is available. It was 2 o'clock that day, and I told my wife it was on a Sunday. I said, let's go eat something. All the stores were closed. Never experienced that before. But we had a, a sister that we had the privilege to pastor who was born in 1924. And she was in her 80s at that time. And she enjoyed it. And she, and she would have an expression. I could just hear it over here. Her name was Bonnie Roberts. And she had an expression. She would say, brother, she said, I love worship. She said, but I love the word of God. She said, I could just eat it all up. And she would just move her hands. I eat it all. She would say, I'm old, so I love the word of God and eat it all. And I said, that's true, spiritually speaking. This is our food. You want to survive spiritually, get into the word of God. You want to survive in your family, in your marriage, get them into the word of God. You want people to change? You start first by getting into the word of God. Then you're going to see the results that you need. I'm not talking about material possessions. All of this is going to stay behind. When God calls us, all this is staying behind. The best cars you got, all the best house, all that is staying behind. What I'm talking about is growing and receiving spiritually what God has for you. That wonderful song, heaven will surely be worth it all. Won't it be worth it all when all of this is gone? And Josiah knew this. There was a danger, but guess what? There was also blessings when he rediscovered the word of God. And the first thing that he did was to repent and turn as a leader from the evil things. We want revival in the church of God. We need true repentance. We do. We want God to, to move in our house, in our marriages, with our children, with our neighbors, with our friends. We need true repentance. We need true forgiveness. And even if I haven't offended the person, I, I'm just going to go and ask them to forgive me. Why? Because it's because of the well-being of their own soul, because I love them and I desire for them to make heaven their home one day also. Now, what does it mean to keep the vision alive? It means that we are to keep the Word of God active in our lives daily and in the church. You see, the vision of the church is not dependent on material possessions. It don't matter. Just in the 1930s, when you, when you start a church here in Tennessee, you, you started in a, in a brush harbor. You remember those brush harbors? It was just made out of sticks and you had all these leaves up there and they'd worship the Lord down the road and the power of God would fall in that place. Because it really didn't matter what was around them, they were willing to walk with God. God hasn't changed. He's still the same God. The vision of the church is not tied to a particular person or location. It's not constrained by time or specific dates. But we refer to when we refer to the vision of the church is that the scriptures provides us with the complete story of God's plan. What is God's plan? To gather all his children in one. Now you say, I don't, how's the, how, how is God going to do that with all these different doctrines and teachings? I don't know. But if God says it in his word, then it's going to come to pass. Amen. And I've seen it before. I've seen God fulfill. If you're faithful to God, God is faithful. He won't leave you. Amen. What did the book of the law reveal to King Josiah? 
It revealed the true character of God and His expectations for His people. Why do you think some folks sometimes are a little scared to open up the Bible? Because they know that they're going to be confronted with their own situation. Amen? But it's better to be confronted with this now than to confront this situation in eternity. In two places that we will end up. Away from God from eternity or with God in eternity. There's no in-between. There's no in-between. It's crucial that we keep this alive. With who? With our children. With our families. With ourselves. It says that he rent his clothes. What does the Bible reveal to us today about our condition without God? That sometimes we don't know how far we have gone without God, that we are just used to it. Oh, well, that's just how life is, they say. You're going through the situation, well, that's just, you ever heard somebody say, well, that's just Nathan's bad luck. That's just my family's bad. We've had bad luck all our lives. No. Uh uh. Look for God. Don't become religious. There's a lot of that going on today. You know what religious, what a religious person is? Is a person that comes to church, opens their Bible, closes their Bible, sits down, stands up, worships, sit down, and go home and continue to be the same all week. Don't become religious. Have a true relationship with Jesus. A true relationship with Him. Now, verse 11, let's read 11, 12, and 13. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Hakim and Ikim, the son of Sephan, and Akbor the son of Micah, and Shinai the scribe, and Asiah, a servant of the king's, saying, listen to what he said, Go ye, in other words, go and inquire of the Lord for me, for the, for the people, and for all Judah concerning the words of his book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book, do according unto all that which is written concerning us. What did Josiah say? Hey, go search and find somebody that can bring us some positive news from all of this. And we're going to end here. What does verse, the Bible continues to tell us. Now I'm going to skip from, from 14 to 17. But from 14 to 17, we find out that God's judgment had already been set on the nation of the southern kingdom. They were going to suffer because remember, historically, right after this, they were taken captive by the Babylonians. Because of what? Because of their sin against God. But listen to verse 18. But to the king of Judah, so this is God speaking directly to him. To the king of Judah, he's speaking of Josiah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall ye say to him. So he, this is what the prophet has said. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thy heart was tender. Listen to what God is telling Josiah. He's saying, Josiah, because your heart is tender. And thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord. When thou heareth what I speak against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and has rent thy clothes and wit before me, I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. You know what? He didn't experience in his king, in his time as king, he didn't experience the judgment that would fall on the people. Why? Because he humbled himself before God. 